Okay, so in this video I'm going to be talking to you about the properties of motion. So we're going to do a real introduction to the mechanics topic of uh, this level of physics. But before I do, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can go about using these videos most effectively and using other resources as well. So one of the first key things to get in with any topic is understanding the terminology that's going to be used. So if I'm going through this video and you, I will use a term and you don't know what it means, it's critical at that point that you actually stop, pause the video and actually look up what that thing means because that's how you're going to get maximum out of it and improve your understanding the most. So make sure you are doing that routinely as you use these videos. Um, but let's crack on and look at the properties of motion. So in this video I'm going to look at a couple of different things. I'm going to look at what the different properties of motion are, and then I'm going to split some of those properties down further. So I'm going to look at, say, average velocity and instantaneous velocity, and look at what the difference is between those two. And then we're going to look at what a vector is, and how we can represent them using vector notation, and also represent them using magnitude and angle. But we'll explain what those things mean later on. So let's get cracking. So the different properties of motion and the things that cause motion we're going to talk about are these five that you can see on the far side. So let's start off looking at force. So in terms of defining what force is, you can see that up here. Force is defined as the push or pull experienced by an object as a result of its interaction with another object. So there's two key takeaways from this. One, Forces can act in two directions, so you've got two objects, they can either pull each other together or they can push each other apart. Those are your two options with forces, but you can have both. The second key takeaway is you can't just have one object and a force act on that object. That force must come from something else. So for instance, with me, um, my weight force is created by my interaction with the planet, so our two masses interact with each other. If I push someone, I am the force is created by the interaction between the two of us when you make contact with them. So there's different types of forces, but you always need at least two objects. You can have more than two if you want. So that's force. Energy is very, very strange. Um, but we're going to look at energy from the perspective of the ability to do work on something else. So if something has a lot of energy, that means it can do a lot of work on the things that surround it. So if something's really hot, it has the potential to transfer lots of thermal energy or do work on its surroundings to heat them up. If something has a lot of kinetic energy, it can collide with things and transfer its energy, so transfer or do work on those objects. And if you stretch out a spring, it has the ability to do work on, say, I don't know, some sort of projectile, like a stone or a rock that you're trying to fire out of your catapult. Um, you have a lot of elastic potential energy, you have the potential to do a lot of work on other objects around you. So that's the context we're going to look at energy from. Okay, so let's look at our first property that an object can have. So this is our real first property of motion. So you should have come across distance before. So distance is defined as the length of space between two points. So say, for instance, I might be one meter away from this board. That's me giving the distance there. So with saying that, I haven't given you any indication of my position relative to the board. So I told you how far away I am, but actually you don't know like in terms of what direction that is. So what I've given you there is called a scalar. So when I just give you the size of something, but no indication of direction of something. So distance is a scalar. There's a, when I give both the size, or magnitude as it's called, and direction, that's called a vector property. So the vector equivalent of distance is called displacement. And the displacement tells you how you would go from one end object to another. So for me, it wouldn't just be that I need to go one meter to get to the board. It's one meter at an angle of, I don't know, 30 degrees or whatever you want to give at. But one of the ways we often see vectors is we use our x, y, and z coordinate system as a way of t telling us how to go from something. So instead of saying go one meter at 30 degrees, I might go half a meter this way and then three quarters of a meter this way, for instance. So in terms of what those look like diagrammatically, 
We've got these two points A and B here, and we can say they are 10 metres apart, or the length of space between them is 10 metres. So what we're saying is their distance is 10 metres. What we can also say is to go from A to B, we would need to go 6 metres down and then 8 metres across. So in the green, that's our vector. In the red, that is our scalar or your distance there. Okay, so essentially that's the, one of the key the distinctions we're going to be making most of the time now. We're going to be dealing with vectors when we deal with the motion of objects. Uh, beforehand, you've almost certainly dealt with um, like distance, speed, that kind of thing. We're going to deal with displacement, velocity, acceleration, and those kind of things. Okay, so um, let's have a look at how we actually express vectors. So um, one of the ways we use is sort of like your coordinate system you've come across before. So what you can see up here, um, here is if we want to go from A to B, that's why we've got AB with an arrow going from A to B. We can see that we need to go across 8 here, so our x direction is on top, and we need to go down 6, so we've got minus 6 in the y position. If we were doing three dimensional, the next one down would be the z coordinate as well, but we're not really going to come across that very much. So, what you can see is we've actually formed a right angled triangle because the x and the y directions are perpendicular to each other. So we can use some Pythagoras, and if we do 6 squared plus 8 squared and square root it, we see that we get 10 metres. So we can see that the magnitude of your vector is the same as the scalar of distance there. Um, so that's what we call that, the magnitude of the vector, or the size of the vector there. Okay, so that's what it looks like in terms of this. So then, okay, so we've said we've got uh, we can express it using that coordinate system, but I said earlier we'd be able to express it in terms of magnitude and direction. And this is where the trigonometry that you should have learned beforehand will come in handy. So we've said to go from A to B, we need to travel 10 metres. But 10 metres in which direction? Well, we can use uh, a tan rule here, and we need the opposite side and the adjacent side, and we can then solve that to work out that this angle here is 37 degrees or 0.64 radians. And the further you get in physics or engineering, the more you'll use radians rather than degrees. Uh, but we'll give both for now on. So actually, now we've got this angle, we can see that we're going to need to go essentially 10 meters at 37 degrees below the horizontal or the x direction here. So if we drew another line in across here, this angle here would be 37 degrees. So it's 10 meters at 37 degrees below the horizontal there. Okay, so for our next property of motion, we're going to talk about velocity. So you have probably come across speed before. So speed being the amount of distance that an object travels in a certain amount of time. So velocity is quite similar to that, but it has a more precise definition. And velocity, like displacement, also has a direction. So speed is just a size or a magnitude. Velocity has magnitude and direction. So velocity is a vector quantity. So velocity is defined as the rate of change of displacement at a specific moment in time. So it's often known as instantaneous velocity, but that's very long, so we just call it velocity for short. Um, so that's your definition of velocity, but there's another property similar called average velocity. And average, the average velocity of an object is the total displacement the object uh, experiences divided by the time over which that occurs. So there's subtly different versions of velocity, and we need to know the distinction between the two. So we just first talk about instantaneous velocity, or velocity for short. So if velocity is the rate of change of displacement with respect to time, that means it's the gradient of a displacement versus time graph. So in black over here, which I'll just trace that out, so in black we've got some very random displacement versus time graph there. So if we want to know the velocity at a specific moment in time, say here, we want to know the velocity here, we would need to find out what the gradient of that graph was at that point. Um, for a graph that's not a straight line, what that means is we draw a tangent to the graph and figure out the gradient of the tangent, that will be the gradient of the graph. So that's how we work out instantaneous velocity. Average velocity we'll do slightly differently. Uh, so we can see that in red. So for average velocity, 
All we're interested in is where did it start and where did it end, so we can work out the total displacement. Then we want to know how long that took, and we divide the change in displacement by the time it taken, and that will give us our average velocity during that period of time. And you can see that one in red. And you would almost certainly get completely different values for those two. But if this graph was a straight line graph, the instantaneous and the average velocity would be identical to each other there. Um, but when we get a curved graph, they are different. Okay, so that's your velocity, two types of velocity. Uh, so, again, you may well have come across acceleration before, uh, as in the rate of change of speed before. Here we're going to define acceleration as the rate of change of velocity, again at a specific moment in time. So this has, again, a size, a magnitude, and a direction, so acceleration is a vector quantity too. And again, we also have this property called average acceleration as well. So typically at this level, you will come across constant acceleration scenarios. So like I was saying before, if you have a straight line graph, for uh, the velocity versus time, that means the gradient is constant, which means acceleration is constant. So if we worked out the acceleration at a specific point, or if we worked out acceleration over the period of time, we would get the same value, um, because the gradients are the same there. Um, so that's typically what you will encounter at this level. We deal mostly with constant acceleration, but Again, we could have a really wavy graph, with, and it would be the same as we had with velocity. Uh, so that's your acceleration. So let's just review uh, what we said we're going to take a look at in this video to finish off. Um, so I said we're going to look at different properties of motion. So the properties of motion we've looked at, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. So you should be able to define what those are and explain how you would calculate them from graphs. You should be able to tell me what the difference between average and instantaneous velocity and acceleration are, um, how the different ways they would be calculated, and you should be able to uh, represent vectors both in those like, columns with the brackets, but also as a magnitude and direction using Pythagoras and trigonometry to do that as well. Um, so if you're not clear about any of those things, it's time to go back, rewind, and check those out, or get out a textbook or something to look those up. Um, but that's realistically at this point what you should be able to do. Uh, so thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you found that useful. Um, if there have been any problems or any questions that you have as a result of this video, please feel free to comment on this video and let me know. I'll do my best to answer them for you. But thanks for taking the time to watch.